Welcome to Bright Divinity School's Borderlands Institute webinar series on the theme of responsibility and immigration. My name is Francisco Lozada Jr. and I am the director of the Borderlands Institute at Bright. Before we move to our presenter today, allow me to thank a few colleagues who have been supportive and instrumental behind the scenes to bring these webinars to fruition. Thanks to Rowena Tart, Rachel Harris, and Kathy Cairo for their administrative support. I'm also appreciative of the work of Vanessa Daly in marketing the events, and to Yadi Martinez in getting the word out about these events on social media. I am also quite indebted to my colleague, Timothy Sandoval, for his facility as a dialogue partner, and thanks to my administration, Dean Michael Miller and President Neil Williams for their encouragement. And particularly, a thank, thanks goes out to Texas Producer for creating these webinars. And finally, I am especially grateful to the Henry Luce Foundation for Theology for making this webinar series possible. Briefly, for those who are new, this webinar series aims to bring awareness to the very complex issues around immigration. This fall, we discuss xenophobia and migration, children and migration, gender and sexuality and migration, climate-driven migration, and today we close with a discussion around justice and responsibility and migration. Please note that all the webinar events are recorded and you can find them on Bright's YouTube page. Today's event will be posted in a few days. Our guest speaker today is Tisha Rajendra, Associate Professor of Christian Ethics at Loyola University, Chicago. She is the author of Migrants and Citizens, Justice as Responsibility in the Ethics of Immigration. This volume, um, I would like to add, inspired this webinar series. She, also, uh, she has also published in the Journal for the Society of Christian Ethics, Ethical Theory and Moral Practice and Political Theology. Her research areas include the ethics of migration, solidarity, virtue ethics, and the philosophical and theological theories of justice. She is currently working on her second book, a, vo a volume on solidarity as practiced by fragmented selves in the context of injustice. Professor Rajendra's presentation today is entitled Justice as Responsibility, Migration, History, and Ethics. So without further ado, join me with a virtual clap and welcoming Tisha Rajendra. Rajendra. Tisha, the stage is now yours. Thank you so much, Francisco. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I was so honored to receive it, and I was uh, so so humbled by the fact that you saw something in my book and um, like decided that you were so interested that uh, that it informed an entire webinar series. So, thank you. I almost feel like I can't live up to that mm -hmm. introduction. Um, so I'm here today to talk about justice as responsibility, migration, history, and ethics. Um, and this, these ideas are laid out in a book I published in 2017. Um, and as all of you know who are familiar with publication schedules, um, if a book is published in 2017, it means you've spent, you know, the past five to ten years writing it. So most of the ideas in this book, um, I was writing it during, uh, thinking about them during my dissertation, the latter half of the second Bush administration um, and the entirety of the Obama administration. So it was a really different world. Um, it was before mm -hmm. Brexit. It was before uh, the election of Donald Trump. Um, it was before a lot of the Syrian refugee flows. Um, and it was, it's interesting to me to like go back to it now, uh, thinking about the last four years in mind. Um, you know, when you write a book, it's a snapshot of you, uh, mm. or it's a snapshot of your thought at a certain mm. time and place and people change, mm. the world changes. Um, and so sometimes your ideas hold up and sometimes you revise and tweak and sometimes you move on and discard. And we see this with, you know, um, the work of like Augustine, you know, he changed throughout his life and his work changes too. Um, so I um, am using this webinar as an opportunity to think through 
um, some of the major foundations of what I was saying back in 2016 and to think about how uh, the world has changed and how I might revise or tweak or change um, a little bit of what I said uh, four years ago now. So um, when I think about the last four years, um, the there's this one incident that I really can't forget. Um, I read about it in July on July 5th, 2018, um, in the middle of uh, the the press around Trump's uh, family separation policy. And um, it was an op-ed by an immigration lawyer who was working at the Texas-Mexico border. Um, and he had interviewed a father from El Salvador who, uh, who, whose child was taken away from him. Um, and like this child, she haunts me. He, the border agents were taking her away and he was trying to shelter her from pain and trying to reassure her. And she said, you know, where are they taking me? And he said, you're going to summer camp. And she was all excited about it. And she walked away from him with this spring in her step and this huge smile on her face. And I, she didn't know what lay in store for her. And we don't know what happened to her. We don't know when they were reunited. We don't know. I have to think they were because unlike a lot of parents, she had an attorney. Um, her, her dad had an attorney. Um, and I think all except 545 of the parents have been uh, reunited with their children. So I have to think that she came back to her dad, but I can't get that image out of my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's who I'm thinking of when I revisit uh, what I think of as justice as responsibility to relationships. So this is the theory of justice that I lay out in my book. Um, and it's about how responsibilities are determined by specific relationships. So in a lot of the philosophical literature and theological literature, there's two kinds of relationships, there's or two kinds of categories of people, people in specific relationships to us, people who are in general relationships to us, and their general responsibilities of beneficence, do good if you can, non-maleficence, don't go out of your way to harm anyone. But other than that, we have specific responsibilities to the specific people in our lives. Um, but I actually reject that. I think that we are all in specific relationships to one another. Um, and there is no hard division between, um, between uh, general relationships and specific relationships. Um, and the second premise of justice respons as a responsibility to relationships is that narratives about identity and relationship, which may be more or less faithful to reality, map responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, the kind, the way we understand these relationships and the stories we tell about them give us some idea of our relationships. Um, so for example, um, you know, the kinds of stories we have about the ideal relationship between mothers and children give us specific content for our, our socially constructed ideas about our responsibilities to children. Uh, should we breastfeed? Should we use daycare? Should we continue to work? Should we rely on assistance from the state? Is the state going to provide us uh, with assistance? Um, that comes from these narratives we have about what family relationships should look like. Um, so justice as responsibility requires, I said in my 2017 book, interrogation of false narratives in the public sphere. So false narratives lead to unjust distributions of responsibility. Truer narratives lead to more just distributions of responsibility. So when we see false narratives, we have to interrogate them, we have to question them, we have to replace them with truer narratives through this public process of public conversation. Um, justice as responsibility also requires advocating for the structural realization of the responsibilities that come from truer narratives. So these responsibilities can be on a personal level, um, but they but structures, social structural processes are also ways 
of fulfilling our responsibilities to one another um, through, as I mentioned, the public provision of aid, for example, or through immigration policies. Um, so when we have unjust structures, um, we have uh, we also have unjust social structures. When we have unjust narratives or false narratives, we have unjust social structures. Three, um, we must act in consonance with our responsibilities when structural justice is not possible. So um, we still have personal and individual and non-governmental responsibilities to other people, even in the midst of unjust processes. And four, um, we have the responsibility to tell and promote true narratives wherever we can. So uh, the first uh, responsibility of justice and respons as responsibility is the interrogation of false narratives. Um, and I have actually two false narratives that have been promoted in the last four years. One is the first one is the most pernicious and false uh, that leads to the greatest injustice. Um, migrants are criminals who invade us and take us over. Um, the other one is that we must help uh, others who are in need of our generosity. So migrants are helpless others who are in need of our generosity. Um, that's not entirely false, but it's not the full truth. Okay, so this dad was from El Salvador um, and his daughter were from El Salvador. And to see them as criminal invaders who just show up is obviously false. A uh, brief history of El Salvador in three minutes. Maybe some of you know this material better than I. Um, but the relationship between the US and El Salvador um, goes back decades uh, in when the US intervened in Salvador's military dictatorship by funding it. Um, and so we have a picture of Reagan with a Stop Communism in Central America or Stop Communism Central America t-shirt, not just a slogan, but uh, you know, millions of tax dollars went into propping up military dictatorships um, and uh, funding right-wing, funding and training right-wing paramilitary organizations. Um, the Salvadorans in the midst of a war do what many people in the midst of wars do, they fled. Um, and they fled directly to the United States where because of uh, Reagan's intervention in the State Department, many of them, even though they were completely political asylees, were not granted asylum. Um, the State Department intervened in U.S. immigration courts. They issued, uh, they every time um, a Sal there was this broad directive to not grant Salvadorans uh, refugees refugee status um, or asylum, mm -hmm. asylee status, um, even though they clearly met the definition of political refugees and political asylees. Um, some of them were deported. Some of them became undocumented. Uh, in the early 90s, there was a settlement in which they were granted uh, protected status. Um, however, that was under the first Bush administration. Um, however, many of them were not granted, the ones who stayed, some of them went to Canada, the ones who stayed were not granted full citizenship. Um, in 1996, Bill Clinton signed into law the uh, Immigration and Refugee Reformation Act. Um, and as a part of that, it, uh, it um, criminalized, um, and so basically any migrant who committed any crime was therefore eligible for deportation. Um, after September 11th, the deportation machine, they actually went through the records of people because usually immigration records like, you know, state or federal criminal records, they're not totally integrated, especially in the 90s. It wasn't like there was this computer system where if someone was uh, prosecuted with a crime, their name would immediately pop up in the computer system. They were two paper records that were stored separately, some in state warehouses, some in federal ones. Um, so after 9-11, there was this effort to like go back and find people who had been prosecuted for minor crimes sometime in the past 
20 years and deport them. Mm -hmm. um, some of these people who had been deported for minor crimes uh, were in gangs. And so the Central American gangs um, are bear the names of streets in California. They didn't start as Central American gangs. They started as Californian gangs. And a lot of those young people joined gangs in part because they were shut out of mainstream society. Uh, they were living as undocumented immigrants during their ch often scarred by war um, in California. They couldn't access the support they needed for to process their trauma. Um, and some of them, though certainly not all, entered gangs. So basically, US deportation policy seeded Central America with gang violence. Ongoing deportation policy um, enabled uh, basically gang recruitment. You had people who had grown up here, maybe their Spanish was non-existent or weak, all of a sudden for minor crimes, shoplifting, drug, minor drug offenses, being deported to countries they had never seen where they didn't have a social network, and they were ripe for recruitment into gangs. Um, so deportation policy turned a California problem into a transnational gang violence problem. Mm -hmm. So when you think about um, this dad and this daughter who were fleeing El Salvador, fleeing gang violence in El Salvador, obviously they are not criminals who have the intent of invasion and over overwhelming us. They are fleeing criminal violence um, in El Salvador, but they're also not helpless people who just turn up at our doorstep, who are in need of our generosity. Uh, there is a historical relationship between our country and theirs that dates back decades. Um, but, you know, asylum policy is actually based in that lat latter account, helpless people who just turn up here. Um, and it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have been granted what they were entitled to under asylum law, but it does question our moral reasoning here. Mm -hmm. Were they really helpless others who just came here because they had no other choice? From one perspective, yes. From other perspec another perspective, that's not the truest story we could tell mm -hmm. about this family. Um, another thing that I've thought of in the past four years is the way that um, it, it's in the book, but not as fully as it could be. Narratives tell the relationships, the, the stories, not only of our relationships, but the story of who we are, which is, of course, constituted in part by the stories we tell about relationships. Mm -hmm. So one thing I kept hearing that summer of 2018 was this is not who we are. Um, and then I heard a counter narrative, an attempt of historians and scholars of race to say, well, actually, your narrative is a little bit false. Um, we have a long history of separating mothers from their children, of separating families. Um, and it's always those who are outside of the sphere of moral concern to, to whom this happens. So mm -hmm. slaves and their children outside of the sphere of moral concern because they're not really human or so the thinking went. Um, this is a picture of uh, mothers in a uh, prison. Um, so yes, slavery was a long time ago, but the separation of families occurs every day when mothers and fathers are imprisoned, um, not because they are really a threat to public safety, uh, minor drug offenses, not having an attorney, uh, cap, not having the money for cash bail. And in many cases, their children, in many cases, sometimes their children are raised by family, which is uh, not as bad. Um, in some cases, their children go into foster care because they don't have family members who are equipped to take care of them. Um, so family separation is continuing. Um, so this is not who we are. I don't know about that. Uh, oh, but I also want to just issue a caution that, you know, we're just horrible, corrupt, evil people who separate families. Um, that is also a false narrative. It's also an invitation to despair. Um, so, of course, the truth is complicated. It's somewhere in the middle. There was a huge outcry against these policies. Trump was shamed into reversing it. Um, so it's not quite 
that this is not who we are, but it's also not quite true that, you know, immigrants were separated, migrants were separated from their children and no one cared. That's not true either. Uh, something I've been thinking a lot is something that I've got been asked a lot about since the book was published, which is how do we change false narratives? Mm -hmm. um, and I used to just say, I don't know. Um, and then I used to think, I really don't know, because there's some social science research that says that the more you talk to someone on Facebook, <laughs> your uncle, about their racist false narratives, the more desperately they cling to them. Um, so any conversation on social media appears to like entrench us more in our false narratives and make us cling more ferociously to them. The more you present facts to someone, well, actually, COVID vaccines are not going to kill you and do offer protection, the more the more entrenched people become in their false narratives. Um, something I've been thinking about, not in any serious way, but uh, is a practices, there are practices that change people's minds. It's not easy, but practices like deep canvassing, where you go to people um, who, you know, whatever, let's say there's a, a bathroom bill on a referendum in your area. Um, and instead of saying, well, actually, do you know that trans people are more likely to be assaulted in bathrooms than to assault, assault other people? You ask questions. Um, have you ever been uh, discriminated against? Oh, really? Okay, that, that must have been a really hard experience. Um, and then you keep asking questions. And then at some point, you kind of make a connection. Well, you know, it a lot of trans people are, you know, afraid that they'll feel just like you did, um, mm -hmm. or they felt just like you did when they're forced to use mm -hmm. a bathroom that doesn't align with their gender identity. Um, and that it doesn't work all the time. It actually doesn't work most of the time, but it works mm -hmm. enough of the time mm -hmm. that we can keep, maybe we can, with a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of patience, we can keep the most pernicious false narratives at bay. I'm mm -hmm. still uncomfortable with this because it seems like trans people or undocumented immigrants have enough to worry about without having to door knock and convince people that they're fully human. But is there really any other way? I'm not sure that mm -hmm. there's any evidence that there is. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so another part of my book is that justice as responsibility means advocating for the reform of unjust social structures. When I think about this dad and this girl, I can come up with at least four. One, um, determining responsibility for gang violence in Central America. I've already intimated that it's not only a Central American problem, and it's not even a problem that originated in Central America. Now, I think you can do maybe good things with the wrong moral reasoning. So if you go in and say, well, we have to solve gang violence in Central America because we don't want these migrants coming here, that's not, that's poor moral reasoning. Um, however, you could say we have to do something, we have to help these countries deal with their gang violence problems because these are transnational problems that affect us and because we had a hand in creating them. That's a different moral reasoning. Um, dismantling the immigration detention system. There is no reason to imprison asylum seekers while they wait for their hearing. Our for-profit immigration detention system is the largest in the world and has been expanded by every president since Reagan, Democrat and Republican. Um, so, you know, there's no, there was no reason to imprison this dad. There was no reason to imprison this child. Um, so that's a huge unjust structure that predated Trump's family separation policy that made it possible. Uh, reforming customs border control, rethinking the mission of customs and border patrol. What if their mission was to process asylum seekers instead of defending borders? Um, what if their mission was to care for asylum seekers and help them get the resources they need? I mean, maybe that means emptying it out. Maybe that means abolishing it, but that just the mission of C CPB as it is currently stated is structurally and institutionally unjust. 
And fourth, following our own asylum law. We have laws on the books that protect asylum seekers and establish that seeking asylum is a right. Um, and we don't, we treat asylum seekers as criminals when this is actually a social structure that is not terrible as written that we don't follow. Mm -hmm. um, but in the years that since the book was published, um, I've leaned more on an insight um, from uh, Karen Labax, who uh, almost 40 years ago now wrote a book called Justice in an Unjust World, um, an under read and under a book that doesn't appear on syllabus syllabi as much as it should. Um, but one of her foundational insights is that we any discussion about justice starts with the fact that we are living in an unjust world. Um, that injustice is, it's a very Augustinian, Niburian insight that injustice is always a threat and that the fight against it is relentless. Um, sometimes victories are fragile and temporary. So that means in this earthly city, in this veil of tears, we do have fleeting moments of justice um, and we should rightfully look to them as something to be celebrated and affirmed. Um, that's part of my issue with saying, well, we've always been this way. We've always been terrible people who separate families. I mean, that's tr true. We've always separated families, but we've always, there've always been strand, there's, there's always been justice in this land, um, however fragile however fleeting, however temporary, however imperfect, mm -hmm. it's always been there. So I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. Um, you know, our foreign policy is very much based in, you know, you know, even if it's, even if it's, even if it's not an office, it's still based in, you know, America first, you know, uh, realism, um, where there aren't really strong international structures to address transnational problems like climate change or gang violence. Um, so, you know, determining, accurately determining responsibility for gang violence in Central America is a big ask. And if I would bet, I would best bet that it's not going to happen on a federal level. Um, okay. Uh, dismantling the immigration detention system Maybe that's closer. I mean, really, all we'd have to do is shut down these for-profit immigration centers. Um, reforming CPB, abolishing ICE, again, things I would love to see happen. I, With political discourse the way it is and with people really believing in these false narratives, I'm not betting that that's going to happen. Um, so then, you know, what do we do then? Um, and it's keep fighting the fight, even when it seems like justice is nowhere in sight. Celebrate the, the victories, however fleeting or temporary, as real victories. Um, and then uh, acting in consonance with our collective responsibilities. So um, I follow an immigration lawyer on Facebook. I've never met her face to face, um, but she uh, was for a while uh, working um, with a migrant shelter in Tijuana. And uh, at some point she was trying to find uh, someone who could bake a cake for this couple who was getting married at a migrant shelter at one of these camps. And they were getting married because they were preparing to cross the border into the US where they would be detained. And they wanted some legal claim to each other. Um, and you know, the primary need of this couple was for safety and security. That is what they were owed according to justice, according to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, but she couldn't give them that. And the people surrounding them couldn't give them that. They couldn't give them what they were owed by justice's responsibility to relationships. So they gave them a wedding. They scrambled, they found a priest, they found a baker to bake them a lavish cake, they found a sound system and a DJ and 
a band, so there was music. Um, it's not on any list of human rights that anybody's entitled to a wedding cake or a band. But to me, that was, sorry, that was, uh, that's solidarity. Maybe solidarity is political love. And maybe love is not what Aquinas said. Maybe love is not what going over and above justice. I mean, it makes sense what he said, right? You can't, if you don't provide somebody with their fundamental needs, you can't say that you love them. Okay, so, you know, I love the stranger, but if the stranger's hungry, I'm going to say maybe next time. No, just don't say you love the stranger. It's not true. So I understand why Aquinas said that. And it seems right, but I don't think Aquinas had the tools to think about pervasive systemic injustice in which you can't meet the needs of the people you are, you are obligated to love as a Christian or as a human being. Um, so we love in the midst of profound injustice and we love knowing that justice is not possible. We love knowing that we cannot, at this time, in this place, meet our responsibilities to these migrants. But I don't want to say it's a failure. I mean, it is a failure in, in one sense, but in another sense, it's real love. And, you know, getting a wedding cake baked specifically for this couple, um, when all they really needed was a marriage certificate. Mm -hmm was real love and was real solidarity. So mm -hmm. that's something I've thought more of, like what does it mean to love and to act justly in a world with pervasive systemic injustice that is not going to go anywhere? Or the chances are low that it will go, go anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I want to, I've been thinking about when I think about that dad and her, mm -hmm. his daughter is the need to tell the story. So maybe we tell the story and it changes no one's mind. Maybe we tell the story, but in such a way people are like really turned off and their own false narratives get even more entrenched. I know I've done that, but I don't wanna let go of the fact that telling the story is still important. Um, so we tell the story because it reminds us that our own institutions are so fragile. Um, that the wrong president could come and turn a situation that is unjust into a situation that is, you know, that is so awful we can't even speak it. We, we've traumatized children for their entire lives, hundreds of them, thousands of them. Some are dead in CPB custody. Um, we tell the story because it reminds us of our own capacity for evil. Um, there were good dads working in CPB who did that. There are people who, you know, might be polite to undocumented people to their face, but who voted for Trump and then who didn't speak out against these policies. Um, we tell the story because it reminds us that we live in an unjust world and that on the only fullness of justice can come with the reign of God. Um, but I but and that's why we tell the story to remember so um so yeah i in the years since i've since in the years since writing this book to me the moral imperative to keep telling the stories and to keep fumbling towards justice um has been highlighted so thank you very much um and i'd let i'd uh be open to taking questions now. Okay. Thank you, Tisha. Um, um, I think you, you provide, I've always, what I like about the volume on migrants and citizens in many ways, and I think I, I think in which is absent with a, a number of, of volumes on, on immigration from a theological ethical point of view, is that the volume really pushes the, the reader to think about the questions of justice and responsibility, not, not at the surface or the veneer level, but in a much deeper sense. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where I think our, at least my students in the classroom have been um, found helpful in many ways in terms of pushing 
um, their 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 positions, their theological positions, to begin to think about how to how to take those next steps. And mm -hmm. there's there's I also find it interesting that you wrote this volume prior to Fortelli Tutti, uh, mm -hmm. Francis's volume in many ways. And so there's some similarities there. And I I, I think, um, but um, we can talk about that um, another day. I think so. It's um, um, the we do have a question. Um, it's from Sergio, and um, I have to say, uh, Sergio is um, is the one who emailed me your title of the volume, actually. So it's um, so I, I won't give more more background on him, but um, but I uh, I wanted to, to give acknowledgments to him on that on that front. Um, uh, Sergio asks: In order to protect the persecuted, one has to allow the persecuted in and keep the persecutor out. How do we how do we do that or balance that with the idea of eliminating ICE and or CBP? That's one of his questions. And then let me just ask the second question: How do we embody and teach the idea that we are in relationship with everyone and have a responsibility to them okay. in a world where we legally have no duty to help? Okay, great. Yeah. Really good questions, both of them. So. Um, Okay, so I, a lot of people really do think that there is no moral justification for borders. Um, and I'm not one of them in part because, uh, because I do think that there is a right of communal self-determination. And it's hard to see in the United States where we're constantly going and intervening in other people's affairs. Um, but, you know, I mean, I don't like colonialism because my ancestral homeland was colonized. So, you know, I think that Sri Lankans should have the right without intervention from the British or anyone else to decide their own affairs. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you're talk having that conversation in the United States, it's a very different conversation because we have these responsibilities to people all over the world. Um, and a lot of people, I actually think we have equal responsibilities to them as we have to our own citizens because of these close relationships and because of these relationships of harm. So, um, you know, when I say abolish ICE, I mean, I mean, it, ICE is a recent invention. I mean, it, it was created during the Bush administration after 9-11. So return immigration to immigration and natural eliminate the department of homeland security and i do think that there are some federal agencies that are so irredeemably sadistic and corrupt that it makes sense to just abolish them and start all over however i think if i'm reading sergio's question right he's saying like mm -hmm. if we don't have borders we can't keep gang members out is that correct sergio like we let those persecuted by gangs in, we keep people who are gang members out. Um, well, they're already gang members in the United States. And we do have to be able to tell the difference. And I pretty much agree with that. It gets me in trouble with a lot of immigration advocates. But um, I I actually don't think that, that uh, you know, open borders is going to solve problems. I think it's going to create a lot of problems um, by primarily replacing uh, immigration policy with a market-based policy where anyone who wants to come here, who can afford to come here, can. Um, and that creates, it's going to create different problems. Um, so yeah. that's my response to that question. Can I see the question again to see Sergio's yeah. second question? The second question was, uh, let me see, I'll read it. Um, okay. I'm not sure if you can see it. How do we embody and teach the idea that we are in a relationship with everyone and, ha and have a responsibility to them in a world where we legally have no duty to help? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so there are actually legal duties to help asylum seekers. I mean, they're not like on the on the government level, they at least can't be repatriated. Um, so that's at least one duty that we have. And then I would say responsibilities always go beyond legal norms. So, um, you know, morality goes beyond legal norms. And that's a basic insight of ethics that, you know, yes, the law teaches, but 
we can't legally mandate every action that is good and we can't legally prohibit every action that is bad. So, um, I mean, I think you, you embody it by living it, by taking responsibilities to, to people, narratives tell us are strangers seriously. Um, and then how you live that in your own life is, you know, it's a question of discernment and not easy discernments um, because we can't be in solidarity with everybody. If solidarity is a serious commitment and a serious investment of energy and attention and resources, um, then you can't be with solidarity with every group. Um, but you can be in solidarity, I think, with enough people to live the idea that we have responsibilities that are not just, uh, you know, the principle of benevolence, but actual responsibilities to people. Mm -hmm. Did that make sense? I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think um, I it's, um, you know, there's, I, I'm not going to ask for, I'm going to uh, um, uh, answer for, for Sergio, but I think in many ways it begins to show the, the nuancing, the, the complexity behind some of these questions around um, um, responsibility as well. And these are the discussions I enjoy a lot in class to wrestle mm -hmm. with in ways. I mean, there's a, there's, it's, it's just so multifaceted in many ways, and, and it's just really hard um, to come down to a, a solid position on some of these things. Um, and, and I think a lot of it is, and I think you sort of hinted at this, is that, you know, migration is a transnational element. I mean, yeah. it, 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 people see the role of government in different ways and see borders in different ways. And, and I think um, I think one of the things that I've uh, appreciated from your volume was that, that we can't sort of universalize the migration experience. Everyone migrates for different reasons, mm -hmm. uh, different historical reasons. Um, they're driven by, you know, for a variety of fact, factors. And so we just sort of can't say they're all coming for, they're not all economic migrants, right. you know, they're, they're coming for a variety of reasons um, across the globe. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Timothy. Uh, can you speak about how you understand the role, the range of roles of Christian communities? Mm -hmm. um, qua Christian community, that is which Christian communities vis-a-vis -vis migrants and migration the roles of Christian communities mm -hmm. um, in relationship to migrants and migration. And then, he's, then he uh, asks the role of individual Christians or Christian communities as participants in a liberal democracy. Mm, okay, okay. So Christian communities specifically to migration um, and then uh, Christians in democracy, okay. Yes. So, okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, the role of Christian communities is to welcome the stranger, and Christian churches and organizations have or ought to have infrastructures to be able to do that. So, um, you know, I don't really have a super sophisticated theory of collective action here. Um, I'm not really drawing on any scholarship when I say this, but you know, um, when you are looking to meet needs that cannot or will not be guaranteed by states, um, you know, the state is the ultimate guarantor of human rights, at least in Catholic social thought, um, because the state has the infrastructure to do that, to guarantee food, healthcare, education. When the state is not going to do that for whatever reason, um, any other solution, any other institution is going to be too small and too piecemeal. However, a larger institution is going to, can, has the potential to be more effective um, in providing funds, in providing, uh, you know, food, in providing um, wedding ceremonies, in providing lawyers. I mean, these are some high cost needs. Um, that being said, um, you know, there are also relationships of mutual aid, like, you know, especially like on through social media, like mutual aid societies, like I need a wedding cake or I need a, you know, this family I'm supporting needs diapers or formula or whatever. And people do step in to help 
um, without any infrastructure. So I would say that the needs are so great that you could almost see like um, layers of institutions, Christian institutions helping, whether they're like church institutions, um, like Catholic Relief Services, or Christian institutions like um, the Kino Border Initiative, or um, individual churches. It just with infrastructure, it's easier to meet a need. But there's such endless needs that, you know, helping settle a mom and two kids in a new city by giving a donation of $100 also helps without much infrastructure. Um, the role of Christians in a democracy, um, I think, is to, I mean, again, multiple roles, uh, as with the church. I mean, the the impetus to, like, keep telling the story, I think, is really important. Um, I haven't thought too much about it, but honestly, does anybody really want to go talk to Trump voters and convince them not to be racist? I don't think anyone really does, but isn't that part of preaching the gospel? I mean, they're already Christian, a lot of them, but aren't they in desperate need of conversion? Um, so not glamorous work, not fun, not anything you can brag about, but super important um, in a democracy to have these conversations. And I have a couple of students this semester who are writing about uh, social media and how like nobody gets converted on social media except to like even more extreme and entrenched positions. But having conversations not through social media, I think is really important for democracy and for the church and for like, you know, recovering whatever nascent sense of compassion can be dragged out of this country at this point. Um, was there, I, so I think I answered both parts of that question. Oh, uh, you're muted. About that. Uh, can you see the next qu question from Andrew? It's a long question, so I- I cannot. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> you think he said he saw the Summa on my bookshelf. I didn't have time to read the whole thing. It just flashed up briefly. Can I look at it under, under all? Oh, here uh, we go. Here I yeah. see it now. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So the whole trick of Thomas, of reading Thomas, is that you have the, to. Can we uh, share the question to? to yeah, it's all? under the chat. But he says, "I was glad to hear you mention Thomas Aquinas, and I think I see his Summa Theologica on your bookshelf." That's true. <laughs> he says, uh, "In question fifty-eight, one through two, justice can be defined as the habit which renders to each his right or due with a constant and perpetual will." Is it your position that we determine right or do through relationship? Um, yes, we do. Through relationships and through the stories we tell about them. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the whole trick with Thomas is it's in the details, right? Like rendering to each what he or she is due can li literally mean almost anything. But Thomas is not saying, oh, it's totally relative. He has some very specific ideas in mind, like in his section on private property, where he's talking about, oh no, it's, um, I think he's talking about generosity. And buried somewhere in his reflections about generosity, he says that basically, justice that that beneficence just doing something good because you can is not really it really shouldn't be under justice because justice is what people are owed so if you are giving the hungry something because out of just because you want to and you think that's nice that's actually not justice justice is giving the hungry something it's it's justice sorry i'm mixing this up i should have read it before this it's justice to give the hungry food because it is what they are owed but you would miss that if doing like, you know, a quick skim of Thomas on justice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not easy, I think, in Aquinas to say what somebody is owed. Um, but I don't think it should be because it is the virtue that governs all relationships. It governs interpersonal relationships. So that's not easy to figure out what who is owed 
what, even when you're talking about just individual relationships. Um, and the more layers you add to this, social relationships, relationships in a society, relationships within a family, relationships within a family and a society, rela transnational relationships, the more and more complicated it gets. Um, so yes, that is my position. We determine what is right or do through reflections on the narratives that we have about relationships. And mm -hmm. it's tempting to say, well, we're owed, like there's like this concentric circle with like family mm -hmm. and then community and then church or community is church and then state and then transnational. But that is not how it works. There is no biological ordering of relationships that gives us responsibilities that we all agree on and understand. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that in the last uh, last five five years under the Trump administration that that um, he was unsuccessful, I think, in some ways of building a physical wall, mm -hmm. but he was quite successful in building walls but, um, uh, among relationships. Yeah, whether it's a neighborhood, family, uh, colleagues, mm -hmm. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I, I think your 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 line of argumentation on, on the on the focus on relationship is I think I would agree with you I think it's very important, and one of the things that I've tried to do in the classroom is to emphasize that thematize that a bit more through through history mm -hmm. that is our relationship yeah. with others across the globe, um, and and as we're trying to reconnect that link that has been destroyed through social media mm -hmm. um, and through the policies. That yeah. have been placed um, um, the last. Well, actually, you can go far back in history um, on, on some of that. Uh, um, my question um, here is: Can you talk a little bit more about solidarity? I think I, you end on that point in your mm -hmm. volume, and and I was uh, I know you're working on a second volume. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this is a. It was a. It was. A, I felt myself wanting to read more on that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I really haven't thought much about solidarity since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, not in a, mm -hmm. I haven't worked mm -hmm. on my phone sure. since the beginning of the mm -hmm. pandemic because like mm -hmm. a lot of people, especially mm -hmm. parents, their work just stalled and never, hasn't picked up again. Mm -hmm. But basically the idea is um, I want to think about this idea of the self in this network of relationships, this extremely complicated network of relationships mm -hmm. that gives us responsibilities. Um, and think about how many times we are shaped by these relationships, but we are also shaped by the narratives. Um, and narratives can lead us to um, shape our sense of solidarity, shape what is possible with solidarity, but shape what also um, we think is possible. Um, so I guess I'm looking at times when solidarity is either impossible or goes wrong or is insufficient, mm -hmm. which is, I think, most of our practices of solidarity feel like that. Um, and instead of saying, well, it, it's you did something, you you got a wedding cake, that's solidarity. I mean, it is true, it's solidarity. I, I kind of want to sit with the discomfort um, of solidarity as in impossible moments or solidarity where the cost is really high um, or solidarity where, you know, um, is solidarity like giving something to someone on someone else's terms? Um, you know, does it have to be that? Like, what if somebody wants something from you in solidarity that you can't give them? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm is solidarity and I'm, I'm still thinking through all of these questions yeah, so if i sound confused that's why no no no, no i am no. confused <laughs> no no i agree i i think I, for me solidarity has always been and i again i i, I stumble through this as well because i'm thinking through it as well um is it's about allowing allowing the agency of of the migrant for example to be able to speak in a way that without uh, 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 without speaking over the migrant. Mm -hmm. and I'm not quite sure, to, you know, how to articulate that, but it's it, even, but it's a deeper sense. It's a sense of, it's a sense of giving up 
something of your, I, I wonder if it's a sense of giving up something of yourself to be in a relationship with someone else, mm -hmm. um, a marginalized, part of the marginalized community. I, I'm thinking, you know, you, br you bring up the work of Sobrino. I'm thinking of the liberation theologians that I've read in the past. Um, and, but I'm also thinking about it in a new, new way because of the last four or five years with a heightened sense of xenophobia with a lot of the migration experiences, but also just simply the day-to-day the -day conversation that I have with people um, around me, uh, neighbors and that sort of thing, that they, there's a distance. They, it's, you know, they, they, don't, they don't see any sort of sense of solidarity um, uh, mm -hmm. whatsoever. It's a very hard, and hard border, if you want to make it in some sense. This leads me to a, let me try and make say it leads me to another question is that one of the things you set up and it's in your title is that it's it's migrants and citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and throughout that uh, throughout your volume, for example, it, it's it's they're cast in a binary. Have you rethought is there a way to disrupt that binary without the, your your overarching argument? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, citizens are not a monolith. And I do think mm -hmm. I mean, there are citizens like me who have, you know, mm -hmm. who are immigrants, who are migrants. Mm -hmm. There are citizens who, who have been migrants. Um, there's there. Uh, so, yeah, it's I don't really think it's a binary um, because mm -hmm. of that, yeah. that the, both of those categories are extremely porous. Um, and I think when I, when I titled it, um, and when I read, I am trying to think about responsibilities, um, of citizens who do have more power than migrants and who do have membership in the political community or full membership. I think, I mean, what I'm trying to say is migrants actually do have a kind of membership. Um, even mm -hmm. potential migrants have a kind of membership. They do have claims mm -hmm. um, on citizens. So, um, like, I'm trying to get at aspects of identity um, because I do think that that narratives are about identity. Um, and if you don't share in the nar narrative, then you won't see yourself as sharing in the responsibility. Um, but you know, narratives and citizens are also not monolithic. Um, mm -hmm. okay. I think I'm looking to see if there's another question here. I think we have time for one more. Uh, let me see. Let me just make sure I don't miss any. I don't see any other questions, but uh, it's more of a, let me just maybe conclude with a, with a comment then. Um, in the volume, again, I keep coming back to the volume because we used it in class, but um, one of the things I really thought was very effective was um, looking at the question of immigration and migration through the, the, the volume by uh, Sonia Nazario mm -hmm. and Enrique Journey. Mm -hmm. It was actually a, it was a volume actually I was familiar with when mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I used it in another class once. Oh, nice. Um, but I thought the writing was so effective mm -hmm. in many ways uh, that it tied in. I actually happened to bring in the Kino Border Initiative in my class okay. uh, a couple of days. I, 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 uh, I've taken students there um, oh. in, the, in the past. Yeah. So it's um, and it was really a nice little uh, combination because what the what particularly towards the end, uh, the focus on women and migration and um, children and migration, whatnot in the volume um, with Lourdes and Enrique, the mother, mother, son um, relationship. Mm -hmm. It was it tied, it tied nicely with with uh, Father Victor's uh, telling the stories as well. The strategy of telling the story about the migrants that they were experiencing on, on you know, in Nogales on the Mexican side um, was a nice sort of reaffirmation of these of, of challenging the false narratives yeah um uh, that yeah. that you, you you're you're pushing it also ties into uh, some of the work that uh Faro Arturo Panuelas in El Paso is also doing he's also pushing the the idea of um a, a, against these um false narratives and whatnot and but anyway I, it was more of a it's more of a uh, a comment compliment in many ways that I thought it tied in really well and I I, I bought into the the argument of challenging the um the false narratives and, and 
and bringing new narratives to the scene. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, and that's something that like, you know, when I say challenge, like whose narratives, because it's not like we have, we share mm -hmm. these common narratives. And I actually think, mm -hmm. you know, if you go talk to Mexican American communities, they're gonna tell you why mm -hmm. their families came here and when they have mm -hmm. the true narratives. Like, yeah. no, maybe, maybe no one in that community wrote a history of like, you know, mm -hmm. Mexican labor migration in the early 20th mm -hmm. century, but mm -hmm. they have, they, they know the story. So, it's also you know it's also you looking for overlooked narratives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um silenced narratives forgotten narratives and i guess i i didn't mention that but that's why i think about like how i wonder if that girl is going to be forgotten very soon i mm -hmm. mean that's why i want to keep i think we should be intentionally telling her story so she's not forgotten because that's how false narratives generate like mm -hmm. immigrant communities know the right story or they they right. they're not clueless about the dynamics that led to their family's migration mm -hmm. right um we've reached the end and tisha i want to thank you again um providing us you know some some things to think about um hopefully i think um I, I, people will get to your volume and and uh, also wrestle with these questions of of justice and responsibility, and I think these are these are uh, important questions. I think in theological education right now, in theology, and um, I, I have so many other questions, but that's, we'll leave it for another day. Um, again, thank you for the time and um, for the rich conversation. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you.